for coming in for the beach or whatever. My name is Jonathan Gostan, and this is Nigel Daniels. Um, and what we'll do is we'll spend the next hour or so. We'll try to do, get you out a few minutes early so you can make the transition to the next one. Um, of covering the problems of legacy job and also kind of the, the approach that war has developed to try to deal with this and a few other problems as well. So, get a bit quicker, that would help a lot. So, we'll, we'll talk, talk a little bit about setting the stage for where this technology fits in. Uh, our secure Java containers is really core technology, and then the Java um, legacy Java use case is in the abstract, and then also how you can use this for uh, SQL injection. We are going to do some demos, so what I'm going to try to do is jam through the slides reasonably quickly so we've got time, more time for uh, Nigel to do the demo of the actual product and work and mitigating attack and all that, so it's a little more uh, interesting than PowerPoint, which you guys get plenty of, I'm sure. So we all know that um, application security is kind of underfunded relative to um, its value. I've done a lot of security for years, and I was just listening to a talk by some big CISO for some giant insurance company I won't name two days ago, and he was talking about his budget, which was like $150 million, and then he was saying, but you know, it's, a lot of that is chewed up because we're upgrading our Palo Alto firewalls this year, right? Like to the tune of tens of millions of dollars or some stupid thing. So whenever I talk to security guys, there's still much more in like, let me just play in my network sandbox stuff and that application stuff I'll try to stay, stay out of. So that leaves us kind of holding the bag up at the application level where frankly the security can be applied much more effectively given given the money. That was interesting, the keynote, you know, saying she only spent 28 grand for those, those bugs leading in IE 11. Um, all these recent attacks in press aren't going to change that overnight. Uh, there's always the latest attack that every security person thinks suddenly the money's going to start flooding in for their particular approach. It never happens, you know, it keeps the boil going, but it's not like suddenly things change continuously. So we need to look for things that maybe will approach the problem a little more differently and maybe allow us to scale up application security a little easier than what we're trying to do now, because it obviously isn't like totally getting the job done. You know, nothing is. So if you look at kind of where we could put security, it's kind of like low to high. You know, you have all this money being spent down at the bottom with firewalls and antivirus and, and junk like that. Um, no, lots of money spent doesn't really solve the problem. We all know that. It's amazing to hear these, like the same guy, the same insurance guy who spent all that money on Palo Alto. Like, two minutes later says, well, another big thing around here is the perimeter is dead. <laughs> like, okay, the thing you just spent a ton of money on, you just said it's worthless, you know? It's like, I didn't even have to propose it to you, you actually told me. It's crazy. But, that's, he's got the big title. So, the next thing is you could do things up in the operating system. <clears throat> this typically is agent-based. It's really more of a placement thing. They usually don't have super good connections into the application. Obviously, they can have some ties into the the OS, the placement is nice though, obviously, because then you're much closer to the application that's harder to go around it. Application security, obviously, that's why we're all here. I won't spend a lot of time there. You can do anything if you get up into the app. The problem is doing it at any, at any scale, especially if you talk about, you know, a bank or insurance company or something like that. It's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to, to implement it. But that leaves the runtime, the piece in the middle there that, that's kind of open, and that's where that's where we play. There's this idea of inserting security into the underlying platform. In this case, what we're working on is the Java uh, JIT complier, the Java virtual machine layer. So above the operating system, but below the application. So this, this guy, Joseph at Gardner, he's on this like one-man band trying to form this RASP category. There are a few companies participating. We're here, you see Previty is here. I just met a, a buddy of mine I hadn't seen for a few years. He's at Shape Security. He was like, oh yeah, we're playing in grass. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. So you can go check out what they're doing. There's maybe half a dozen companies trying to build security directly in at the, at the virtual machine layer. And Joseph Feynman is a big proponent, which is definitely useful if you're trying to justify any of this stuff. You say, well, WordPress is it's okay. So, Next thing you know, people actually paying attention. So, and he's a he's a cool guy. Um, so let's talk about the the technology itself and what we've developed. If you look at the typical stack, you've got the operating system at the bottom. The, in this case, the Java virtual machine, and then you've got all this stuff above. Now, note there's all kinds of things between the actual business logic and the virtual machine. Obviously, there's the Java APIs, there's the frameworks, and there's a lot of third-party libraries and open source code you'll find. The quote there that Nigel pulled was, you know, 20% of the code might be homebrewed, the rest of it is all pulled in from somewhere else. So there's a lot of 
open source third party stuff in there as well. So there's a whole pile of things where the vulnerabilities can be, can be found. And that stack generally is also insecure because up at the application layer, the only security inherent in Java is the, um, is the security manager. And the security manager can easily be attacked because if you inject code up there at the Java layer, you're, you're basically at the exact same layer as the security manager. The security manager is not running down in a more privileged ring. It's right up there. So the first thing the uh, uh, malignant code will try to do is kick out the security manager and shut it down. So the core Java security model is just really, really limited. Uh, it doesn't really let you do too much at all very, very reliably. If the F7 is compromised, then you can basically do anything. So basically, you're, no, it's a bad situation. So, okay, so what have we done about it? We've created the idea of basically virtualization or containerization at the Java level. So instead of having your JVM, you rock, drop your application in JVM, now you have a container within which you're running your Java uh, applications. And in fact, you can run multiple Java applications underneath that single WireTech JVM. You basically took the Oracle Hotspot JVM, made heavy modifications for security and virtualization to that, and that's basically what you're getting. So in this case, we showed three of them, it doesn't matter. Now, each one of those containers can boot their own runtime. They can even be different versions because you've got this abstraction layer, which is our virtual machine running underneath. So the idea is here to take a look at this. Now what you've got is you've got your WarTech JVM presenting uh, the runtime up to the application at whatever level you want. And the, the, in, a, in, a, in a high level, there's basically two big things that we're bringing to the table. One is the core containerization or virtualization, where you've got this now sort of bathtub now sitting around the application providing isolation. And then the second thing is there's a whole um, uh, uh, number of security features we bring into that bathtub that you can use to do very specific things. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, for, the rest of the, for the rest of the thing. You can do things like um, <clears throat> a profile of what the application is doing and then set up rules specifically based on what it normally does so you avoid it, uh, it trying to do anything else. Uh, we'll talk about the team detection agency uh, later. Should also um, point out that it also includes coverage for the Java data interface. So the, the JNI is a way we can basically jump out of the Java environment and make operating system calls, typically for performance reasons. We also protect that interface uh, as well, which is very, very unique. Obviously, if you're operating only higher up, you can't do anything like that. Now the rules engine that's built into this container do all sorts of things, and I won't um, spend a ton of time on all the details here, but it's everything from which classes can be loaded, how to handle uh, throwable exceptions, what files you can write to, network stuff, uh, whether you can process for, if an app doesn't process for, then you sure as heck shouldn't let it process for. Uh, if it does, then something's wrong. Um, and we'll give you an example of SQL injection and how we can do things with SQL injection later. But the idea is basically this container is isolating and then watching all the activities of the application and is a position to alert a block based on, based on what it's doing. Um, the nice thing about the rules is A, they're simple, and B, they don't have, you don't have to take the system down in order to instantiate new rules. So if you find something that you want to mitigate quickly, you can insert a rule. You don't have to restart the app or the, or the JVM. And unlike, like, I would say, a WAF or any kind of signature-based thing, the rules tend to be very, very simple. Like, we'll show the SQL injection stuff later when Nigel does his demo. It's one line to turn that engine on. It's not a bunch of string matching uh, or anything like that. And you can see some of the other examples, very simple stuff based on, in this case, file paths an example or, or network. So let's turn to legacy Java, and then Nigel will do the first, first demo. Um, so as you guys probably know, there's all kinds of old Java slopping around in, in organizations. Um, this one's a couple years old. Obviously now, J, um, version 8 is out now, and 7 is going to be end of life. Was it April? It's going to be April 1st, April Fool's Day. So there's all of this old stuff floating around with all kinds of old vulnerabilities, and of course nobody wants to update because they don't want to take the responsibility for updating the app or all the uh, old code that's lying around that's dependent on that old Java, that's why it sits out there. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, this, this is some of the stats, you know, 93 orgs are running Java over five years old, 51 conversions of Java, blah, blah, blah. And of course, there's all these CVEs against these, against these old ones. In this case, that example is Java, Java 6, right? So basically, it's a major pain. It even gets down to objects. Nigel was talking to me about this yesterday, where you can have objects basically that are stored, and they're dependent on particular versions of Java. So if you upgrade the, uh, the Java version, you can't just use that same object. You just have to pull all that stuff out, make sure it's all translated to the new stuff, and then it'll put it all back. So it's a huge up upgrade process for this massive database that nobody wants to take responsibility for. So it's basically an issue. So what are you going to do about it? Well, if you put two and two together, you figure out that what we do simply is we allow you to continue to use the old version of Java inside the container while we provide the modern version of Java underneath, right? So we're containing the old version inside the new version. So of course, the most important thing there is the application is seeing its original version of Java. So as far as he's concerned, there's no change uh, at all. As I mentioned before, it's because you can virtualize this, you can even run different versions on one JVM. That's what Nigel is going to uh, uh, going to demonstrate. Um, so basically, the you know the top part is is obvious because I haven't changed the uh, version that the app seeing. There's no changes, so all four of those things are obvious. And then I can really get to kind of the problem. A lot of times the problem is around compliance. There's some auditor who says like, well, this stuff's old, and I read this all these vulnerabilities, and there's a process that says we have to be patching, and you're clearly behind, and what are you going to do about it, and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you can get the guys off, uh, off your back with this compensating control, which says the application is unchanged, but I'm running underneath a modern JVM, and the modern JVM is what's protecting me from the outside, and therefore basically get lost. That's basically the idea of the basic job. So it's actually a very simple idea, and that's what is attractive about it, is it's a simple way to protect legacy Java apps without having to touch the app, and that's what everybody's trying to do. And with that, we'll get to the first demonstration. I'll turn it over to Nigel. Thanks. Okay, so he gets to talk and do this Nigel, we get to do the dangerous bit. Yeah, right. Yeah, demonstration. I understand far away. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Um, okay, let's jump over here. So, um, we're running a Mac here with our system is running up on the Linux platform, so I've got a virtual machine running here, running the CentOS, and that's got our JVM installed. And all I'm going to do is kick up a startup script, which is going to fire up two instances of Tomcat. I've got Tomcat 6 and Tomcat 7 running. We're going to fire both of those up. Um, so it's fairly straightforward to do. We were about to do this yesterday and he was like doing save password for all the stuff I can say later so he wouldn't yeah. do that. It's, 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 it's really working. It's not going to lose always. I'm so much fun. Okay, so there we go. We've not much to see. Not very exciting really, but we've fired up two instances of Tomcat here. Tomcat 6 has kicked up. And the interesting part is this JRE home. So what we've done is we've set the environment variables to Tomcat and said, when you start, you're going to require Java 5, Java X5. So it's made that request, it followed its regular startup scripts, we've made no code changes, any alterations, the only alteration is the environment settings, so you need Java 5. Straight off to that, we fired up Tomcat 7, and here it's JRE, no one's asking for is, is 6. So again, it's kicked up, it started in a container, and it's now running on what it used to be a Java 6 platform. In fact, the JVM underneath is Java 7 JVM. So both of these are running now in legacy containers. So all things being equal, let's go just check that out. Okay, so this is Tomcat 6. We clicked in on localhost, it's running on 6060. And if I just check the manager. So it's running various things, and here it is, it says I'm running on job 5 on Linux. So just moving over to Project 7. So this guy gives us the same presentation. Um, we've got a few more things running on here. So we're running WebGo 
um, <coughs> that we can do that a bit later on. Um, but here we go, it, it's now reporting the yeah, on the job six straight again. So both of these are up running and uh, sort of fairly happy with where they are. Both legacy applications. So you've got third party apps demanding a back level version. You don't have the code to change it and upgrade it. You can just pop in one of these boxes and it's come back. Easy. So that was the there easy you go. Nice and simple. Something. Okay. So we're going to go back. Thank you. Okay. Easy one. So let's talk about something more complicated, which is which is SQL SQL injection. So how many people are well versed in SQL injection? So we all like get it, right? So SQL injection is you know we're on the input side of an application, you shove some stuff in that somehow makes its way into the back-end query to the database, and the result you're able to extract data as opposed to just a single record or whatever it was you were supposed to supposed to get. I used to do network-based security stuff years ago, and I used to always get this from, from companies who were concerned about this problem because they just didn't have it lifted at all. They had applications they had no control over, and they said, well, you know, because we were looking at it on the network side, and they'd say, well, you got this app sitting here and you guys can tell me what the clients are doing on the front end, but then can you correlate that with the queries that are going out the back end towards the database? And basically, no. And by the way, nobody else could do it either. There was just no way from looking the outside to match up what was going in from the front, which was what was going out the back. And <clears throat> that problem persists, as you can see, any type of injection attack is still, they you know, last top 10, as of 13, as of the last one. Still a problem, there's all kinds of variants. SQL injections, obviously, probably the best known. Um, so basically what we've done about this is because we've got this layer now sitting there in the virtual machine um, piece of the stack, we created what we call this taint detection engine. So basically what we're able to do is we're able to model abstractly what the thing going out the back is supposed to look like based on, in this case, the syntax of a particular SQL variant, starting with, with Oracle. And what we can do is we can basically track the input side, know which pieces of it are tainted, that is, which ones potentially were affected from the user input and which weren't. And then watch to see if it changes the syntax, right? So the idea is like, I know which ones could be my problem. I know what the structure is supposed to look like at the query. If the bad stuff changes that syntax on the back end, then something's wrong. And because where we sit in the JVM layer, if we detect a problem, it's not like a WAF where we're just going to kill a session or something like that and hope the application somehow recovers. We can do a throwable exception, so it can be caught by the application developer and the application can deal with the, the, uh, the effect uh, gracefully. So, big advantage of this, of course, is we're not asking for any sort of tuning or regex or anything like that. It's just going to basically go out of the box with a one line with a one-line rule. Here is the one-line rule. We took a look at it before. Where basically, you just say, turn this engine on for, in this case, Oracle SQL queries. And then what you want to do, you know, when it, when it happens, if you want to actually kill it or you just want to warn on it. And that brings us to the more complicated demo. How are you feeling, Nigel? I'm ready for this one. He's ready. <laughs> okay. Um, so we thought for this one, we're going to go it's well understood around here, so we'll use that or not. Um, so let's bring it up. Um, it's a bit awkward when it's turned around to the streets. Do you want to use that? So let's uh, bring this in and we'll. So we figure that. We'll do is just a fairly straightforward, um, simple numerical projection that is <coughs> nice and easy. We can see fundamentally what's going on underneath, and then I'll go into a bit more depth of how we're doing what we're doing, and we'll look at why this is different from other approaches. So here we go. Um, very simple query. We just fire off a station number. We're saying we want to know what the weather is in uh, Colombia here, and we're sending this identity, and we're getting back one line of data. So if there were a man in the middle attack going on, it would be something like using Burp Maps. Can you call that up? So yeah, got that here. So if we start um, into 
accepting that request, we can start seeing what's going on. We get opportunities to start injecting stuff. We shouldn't be there. Okay, so that's not going to come back, so it's now sat somewhere in here. So here's my request, which you can see I'm on my most pointer. So if we take a look at the parameters, here's the station ID. So straightforward. This one's about to Let's forward that on. Are you trying to do an uh, injection? Do yeah. an injection? Yeah. Yeah, it's not. So, uh, if I want to do a, a single quote on either one of one, or one equals one, and then a space. One equals one, yeah. Normally, this doesn't require the quotes. So, it doesn't? Yes. Mm -hmm. There, we go. Yeah. 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 There we go. There we go. There we go. software demos. Okay, so we we found we can now return the whole database to it by injecting CC in the middle, which is just probably not ideal, so we need to stop this from happening. So let's uh, reset this lesson. So what that's done is copy that rules file 
into the containers location so the containers got a farm structure representing what's going on inside each of them, just recording out from every day using uh, the that's where the security logs all live as well. We've copied that in place and then filed up for a request to reload the rules. And we're still running work going. We've not had to take a break and stop or shut down to reload these things. We've not taken line. So if I try do this one again, and hopefully not have to take all over the place. So, okay, this time this is the result we get back. Since it's very skewed through one or more back parameters. So, what's happened is internally, our tape retention engine has picked up that this injection is taking place. And because we're living inside the Java execution layer, we can throw back an exception. Now, in the Java language, programmers are forced to deal with exceptions. There are an error mechanism, what I mean is that if you're in the middle of a transaction or something like that, and the exception gets thrown, you have the opportunity to roll things back gracefully, or in this case, display something on the screen rather than just bomb out in the network and play. So we take advantage of the location by setting something. So, okay, well, we'll look at how, how we're doing this and go into the intimidation in a bit more detail. Um, so, as far as the job virtual machine is concerned internally, it's representing an SQL statement as a syntax tree. So if people are familiar with syntax trees at all, some of you have to deal with those. It's basically a way of structuring um, a language in a tree like this, so we understand it's a query. A query is always made up with select, from and where. It then has these other things underneath, which can be identified as um, the username and the kind of information. And we can see that at the end, this is the brand part, this is what the user is going to be inserting, and this is where all vulnerability sits. So when we're injecting the OR and injecting the one minus one, this is the kind of thing we're getting. We're actually changing the structure of this thing. We've now got this sort of thing appended at the end. It's perfectly legal as far as SQL is concerned. That's our help. It, it, and that's why it's executing it happily and returning a whole pile of data that shouldn't be returned. Um, but how do we normally try and detect this or prevent this? Well, prepared statements deal with it by basically saying, well, we're forcing this structure to take to be this structure. Anything that appears down here, this is the bit we've said in our prepared statement, is the, the bit people can add into. We'll just treat that as a block. Um, you can find any SQL statements in there and we don't decompose them any further. We just, we just kind of force the structure, which is fine. Um, although some things uh, want to be more dynamic, you may want to construct your queries on the fly, depending on what the user is trying to do and the interaction they're trying to, trying to have. So, what happens with many other systems is they're trying to do some sort of pattern matching to say, well, given the query I'm being presented with, can I spot a pattern in it that's showing me the structure's been changed? Um, but it becomes kind of difficult because it's still legal syntax, and if you don't have the contextual information as to where all this information came from, then it becomes very, very difficult to see what's legitimate and what isn't. And this is why a lot of false positives get driven, especially around SQL injection. It's because people are having a really hard time differentiating between what's legitimate and what is. So, what we do with tape tracking is we're sitting underneath the application, we're sitting in the execution layer. Anything coming into the application passes through us. Anything happening inside the application we see, and anything passing outside the application we see. So we're in this privileged position of being able to say with certainty where everything came from. So in this case, we know with certainty that this was added by the user. All the rest of this could be from static strings inside the application itself, read out the file, we'd spot that as well, we'd know where it came from. So we can say, what level of risk does that present? 
So if we see that hey, our syntax tree has changed, it's a new structure, and that new structure came from external to the application, it came from a web request or it came from um, a user entry field in a larger desktop application, we know that for certain. So now that we've got all this contextual information, we can start saying, well, is this an attack or is this just a behavior? So we see that there's a space for the name, we see that there's syntax in there, we see that there's a change to the tree, that changes all stuff that came from the outside world, we now flag that with near 100% certainty that this is an attack going on. Um, I think it was very clear um, this is the of what we're doing. Um, and try to do some false positive testing and said uh, they didn't you wouldn't need to trigger any um, said it's the nearest it seems to zero false positive so far. So we're, we're quite happy that this seems to be working pretty well. Um, and then the next step for us now is to start looking beyond SQL and start looking at the problems of cross site scripting because it's a similar issue. It's knowing where information came from, being able to track where it came from and understand is it legitimate or not. Um, did you want to go anything? We have to go straight into the next step. Uh, yeah, just a few more slides and we'll see you. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. 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 we'll do this one. We have plenty of time. Do you want to do another demonstration? Yeah, yeah let's go for it. So, it's almost for some sign volunteering for another demo. But, um, yeah. So, what we've, <laughs> what we've, we've set up on here is J4. Um, this link. <laughs> Where I've got J4 on direct. Um, uh, I'm not using it, but you can set it up again. No. So it's a kind of bulletin to new messaging board. I'm going directly to it here, regardless of the injection we're on. Um, and it lets you post stuff. Uh, so I can do a new post. Um, I think. Board. But if they did want to use it, it just shows they have the point of level of tuning 
that we have to go through and testing before we can deploy this in the production environment. Um, but if I go direct, I can say, um, let's go back here. set up the, the solutions that you can deploy in a few phases. The first one is the, the profiling phase. So what you can do is, in, when you're down developing the application and getting into the test phase, you can go ahead and run it on our virtual machine. And basically what will happen is it will generate a real-time report of absolutely everything the application is doing. Now this will be a gigantic file that will run into gigabytes of data. But then we've got this um, plugin that analyzes that. <clears throat> that data set and what it does is it boils it all down in just a couple of pages of the specific rules that model what the application actually does, right? And again, it's that same list of stuff from uh, processes and classes to network and uh, file, any kind of I.O., et cetera, et cetera. And, and that profile alone, of course, is very, very useful because now you immediately have this very, very detailed view of exactly what the application uh, is doing. That could be useful for security, it also be useful just for uh, providing information back to the application developers. Now, I guess Nigel was talking about, actually you should just tell the story about the, the skins file, remember the oh, skins directory, that would be a good example. Yeah, yeah we've um, started working with some customers with this and uh, one team in constructing an enterprise application. We're running this against what they're doing and the security team is a Okay, guys, take a look at this. Is this describing the behavior of your application as the dev team? Um, we just wanted why you're reading the skins directory every 10 seconds because it doesn't exist. And the team might be more than not. What, what, what do you want about it? We never wrote that code. What it turned out to be was that you some components, some um, open source components to construct the UI. These had this behavior of looking for this skins directory which told them how to reconfigure the UI. So if you constructed that directory, you put the appropriate config files in, you can start changing the behavior of the application. And they had no idea this was going on. They just used this component, and have the bots, plugged it in, used the bits they needed. And suddenly you realize they'd included all this other behavior that was just, who knew that was there? Well, they did obviously sort the rules, but. Yeah, so then it kind of speaks to that third, that third party problem. If 7 or 80% of your code is third party, there's no way the application guys are spending much time worrying about it. If it's getting the job done for them, they're just moving on and worrying about completing the project. And so that's where this profile can be very useful with feedback, the feedback from those guys. And actually getting them to see some value of working with you guys, frankly. Then the second thing you can go is you can, then you can start saying, well, let me try to put this in production, but just alert on if anything funny happens, right? So you would basically say, well, I'm going to move into a production phase. I'm now going to use this rule set that's been generated for me because I profiled the app before, I'm going to run it on the Wiretech J uh, JVM, but if it finds an exception to the normal behavior, I'm not going to shut everything down, I don't trust anything that much, I just am going to log that and then go back and take a look. So I'm going to kind of run it in alert only mode, if you will, I can feed it into my sim if I want, however I want to deal with it, the point is, is I'm running in the isolated container and I'm just looking for exceptions to that behavior and maybe there's something I didn't check because I didn't run it long enough before, there's a monthly close or whatever, you basically uh, run it in this mode as long as you want and then if, and you can leave it there forever if you have a process in place that says, well, if I see any exception, I actually go take a look at it and do something serious about it rather than letting it sit in some log somewhere piling up like, uh, like Target did, right? And then of course, Hopefully, once you've got the confidence level where you need it to be, you want to put it into the active defense mode where, um, in this case, if there's an exception to the rule or the, tape, the detection engine is put into blocking mode, 
then you're going to go ahead and actually going to stop the behavior that deviates from the standard. You're obviously still going to log it, you're going to let people know what's going on, but you're actually now going to shut that behavior down and stop the problem right where it starts. So hopefully you'll get to that stage. That's, there's Nirvana. And just one last uh, slide. Do you want to maybe take this slide? You know this material better than me. Uh, sure. Um, so the, uh, I'm, I've seen how people tend to behave uh, or having known as people working in the bar application and use it. Um, the question is, this is great in POC, great in a single machine, but we've got like 10,000 servers out there we need to deal with handling out all this stuff to scale. Um, so, in fact, the environment I've got on here, we put together, I put it down using Puppet and Chef and all of these configuration management tools. Um, we've got quite a, a library of different modules for all of these now. Um, so what we're doing is providing those as templates to people. So you can very quickly say, I've got 500 machines over here running application A, I need to push out a rules update or a change to the wall, then we can kick that off and script it and it can be managed. Um, we've got a set of APIs as well um, for the management and control of this system um, that can be turned on or off. Um, the default is actually JMX, which is kind of Java's native way of managing the JVM. Um, we've built some APIs on top of that in using SSH, so you can actually log into the JVM and start controlling it if you wish, or using a REST API for those who want to build UIs, but those two are kind of switched off as that default. Then they don't present the risk themselves. <laughs> Thanks. So, so that's it to summarize. Basically, we think the runtime layer is really underutilized with a powerful place to insert security. Gardner and Feynman over there is logged onto this RAFS category, so I'd encourage you to take a look at, at all the solutions that are operating in that space and see where they might fit for you guys. We've developed our application security for Java, which gives you this isolation, the ability to do foren threat forensics against uh, your apps, and then alert or block on exceptions to those rules or using the tank detection engine, just using things that break the syntax out of this case. Uh, SQL and then other types of attacks uh, coming out later this year. And of course the big thing is no app changes. And it's also portable, right, because you're running the JVM letter. If you've got uh, infrastructure as a service on your roadmap, no problem moving this up when you move into an IAS model as well. And so that's it. We'll hang around and take any questions. We also have any, uh, we have like screen wipes. If you want a nice screen wipe. I know these are good screen wipes because the guy at the table next to us downstairs, he goes like, Oh, you know, I borrowed one of these before you guys showed up. You know, do you mind? This is the cleanest my screen's ever been. So, if, they, if the uh, other vendors say it's good, it's got to be good, right? So, any questions? And we'll hang around, like I said. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, I guess the Windows environment would be the the main one. The languages, I think, really matter. No, um, we do support other. Uh, on JVM, so um, we've been able to run Ruby, Jython, uh, JRuby. Um, ones we support in terms of the security rules are most of Java. Some of the rules will apply to other languages, but the rules on most of the independent Java API. But, but you can certainly run other languages on the JVMs. Any questions? Job? Okay, good. Thanks for hanging around.
of the query right? So, you know, if the, if the internal code changes the syntax, if the input on that side changes the syntax. If the input on that side changes the syntax. Okay. <laughs> 